want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I'm going to begin reading at verse 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning with verse 6, and I'll invite you to stand with me to honor the reading of God's Word. 2 Corinthians 4, beginning at verse 6. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shone into our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who are alive, or for we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So then, death is working in us, but life in you. May God add his blessing to this reading of his word. You may be seated. Now, weakness is not something we enjoy talking about. Weakness is not something we're, we're proud of normally. In fact, we, we encourage one another to be strong and, and never appear weak, to do everything we can to avoid appearing weak. But if we think about it, weakness is something every one of us can relate to. Weakness, it doesn't matter how strong you may believe you are, or how strong you may be, or how big you may be. It doesn't matter whether you think that you're as strong as a man or woman can be, or whether you think you just can't go on. We all have moments of weakness. And we all have weakness about ourselves. Maybe you think back to a time when you were very sick or, or you were hurting or grieving or when someone you thought you could trust did something that broke your trust. Maybe when you were depressed to the point where you just didn't think you could care anymore. Maybe you're sitting here today and you think right now you're in your weakest hour. It can't get any worse. Maybe you're just so burdened that you don't know what to do. Or maybe you're here today, you're feeling real confident, maybe overconfident, thinking that you've never been stronger, that nothing can bring you down. Well, I believe most of us at one time or other have felt extremely weak, extremely fragile, as though we were simply too weak for God to even use us at all. Ironically, the problem may not be that we're too weak. The problem may be that we're not weak enough. You hear what I'm saying? Perhaps we're simply not weak enough. See, God doesn't triumph in lives that are conscious of their strength. 
But God conquers in lives that are all too conscious of their weakness. Our weakness is the only stage on which God can display his strength. Our weakness is the only stage on which God can display his strength. So as we look at our scripture today, I want you to notice three things. First of all, the weakness of humanity contains the strength of the gospel. In the biblical world, there was a custom of burying expensive treasures in fragile, inexpensive earthen vessels. The weakness of the container stood in great contrast to the value of its contents. My grandfather used to bury stuff in the yard in coffee cans. I know my mom remembers. We used to find silver and, and money buried in the yard, even in some cases years after his death, where he had buried them in coffee cans. Another example of putting great treasures in, in fragile containers, in weak containers. Now this is a great reality of the Christian life. Every believer has a great treasure. Every believer has a wonderful treasure. Look at verse 6. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The same God who flung the stars into space, the same God who created it all, has given you and me life. Eternal life. We have a a wonderful treasure. But that treasure is contained in the weakest of vessels. And that is our frail humanity. Verse 7 says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Have you been to Seagrove and seen them make the pottery there? Probably many of you have. And, and they start with mud, basically. And, and they, they, they work that mud. As it sp spins on the wheel, it's, it's worked by hand with more water being added. And it's, it's shaped. And the least little imperfection will cause it, the wheel to get off balance. And the mud just becomes a lump of clay again. Such a fragile vessel, once it's, once it's complete, it can be strong, it can hold a lot. But it's so fragile that if you drop it on the concrete floor, it's going gonna, it's gonna to shatter into a million pieces. Earthen vessels. Nothing more than clay jars. That's basically, that's what we are. We're clay jars. God created us out of dirt, mud. We're, we're clay jars, earthen vessels. And Paul refers not only to our, our perishing bodies, but also our entire personalities. See, the, the Old Testament often compares powerlessness and littleness in the eyes of God to a clay jar. In Job chapter 10 verses 8 and 9 now you know that Job was in despair. Job was, was in a very low place in life. And we read your hands have made me and fashioned me. Job knew even though he was suffering, that it was God who created him. 
and intricate unity. Yet you would destroy me. Remember, I pray that you have made me like clay. And will you turn me into dust again? In his lowest point, Job cried out to God, Are you going to crush me back into dust? You're the one who made me, but I'm so fragile because you made me like a clay vessel. In Isaiah, in chapter 30, beginning at verse 12, we read, Therefore, thus says the Holy One of Israel, Because you despise this word and trust in oppression and perversity and rely on them, therefore this iniquity shall be to you like a breach ready to fall, a bulge in a high wall whose breaking comes suddenly at an instant and he shall break it like the breaking of a potter's vessel, which is broken in pieces. He shall not spare. So there shall not be found among its fragments a shard to take fire from the hearth or to take water from the cistern. As we read in Jeremiah about the potter making the pottery, one of the things we note is the 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 the, the pile of, of broken pottery. See, when, when a piece of pottery was not perfect, perfected by the potter, it was not good enough to, to, to be used, it was thrown into a pile. Or if it broke, uh, uh, there was a pile of, of broken pieces and all of that thrown in there. That's what Isaiah's talking about. Don't throw me in the, in the scrap heap. Don't throw me in that pile over there. Make me useful. Forgive my rebelliousness. See, the term earthen vessels points to our not just physical frailty, but our emotional frailty. Our our emotional and even our moral weaknesses. See, we are at best like clay jars. The message of Christianity is magnificent. But the messengers are not. Think about that. The message of Christianity is the greatest message of all. It's the one that needs to be heard most of all. But the messengers can be replaced. God can replace us. We are very frail. We are very weak. We are very fragile. We're here today and gone tomorrow. The message is wonderful. And it's timeless. This is a reality. But there's a reason for putting this great treasure in such frail containers. Back in our text, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7 says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. You see, when people look at us and they see God at work, they recognize His greatness, not ours. We don't have any greatness to offer. It's only Him. When God prevails in us despite our weaknesses, it magnifies His power. It magnifies His power to us and it magnifies His power to others as they look at us. His power is more than sufficient to triumph when there's opposition. His power is is great. And those who watch us actually perceive that the power and the ability don't belong to us but to Him. 
We're simply the messengers. We're simply his tools being used. So many people I have heard in, in times of, of their weakness, in times of their frailty and, and pain and grief, said, you know, I, I just don't understand how anybody can get by without a church family. I don't know how anyone can get through such pain and grief and, and need as, as, as I have had if they didn't have a church family. But I'll go even further and say, how can anyone get through it without the Lord Jesus? How can anyone get through their pain without the Lord Jesus? And he's the one we want them to see. And so when, when most people say that, how can anyone get through this kind of grief, this kind of pain, this kind of, uh, of fragility without, the Lord, or without a church family, what they're really saying is without the Lord Jesus. Because it's the church family allowing the Lord Jesus to work through them. This is why we can never present ourselves as anything more than earthen vessels. We're not irreplaceable. We're not that great when it comes to delivering the message of Jesus Christ. When we get to the point when we think we're that great, I'm afraid that's where we've become most dispensable. Because if we get to the point where, where God can't really use us. If we're, you know, if we're that great, we're, we've become greater than Him. We've got to be careful with that. His power is more than sufficient to triumph when we're in pain, when we're being opposed. And this is why we can't present ourselves as being the strong, great people that we may want to think we are. We're merely earthen vessels. We're weak. We're fragile. We're people who need the treasure that we carry inside us in order to get through, in order to appear strong, in order to be sustained. It's only in our weakness that He makes us strong. The weakness of humanity indeed contains the strength of the gospel. Secondly, the power of God prevails in the midst of difficulties. It's our very difficulties that cause God's power to shine greatest and most brightly. Paul makes four Statements characterizing his own difficulties that reveal God's power in verses 8 and 9. We are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. In each of these statements, the first part reveals a human weakness. The last part reveals the more than compensating divine strength. The thoughts that Paul displays in these statements are illustrative of, of soldiers in combat, of great gladiators in a life and death struggle in an arena. We can prevail in spite of outward pressure, he says, we're hard-pressed on every side, but we're not crushed. We're persecuted, but we're not forsaken. Life put the squeeze on Paul. Paul experienced pressures unlike anything most of us can imagine. Paul was imprisoned over and over. He was persecuted. He was shipwrecked. You, you go through the list of, of the, 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 
problems and, and opposition Paul experienced. Most of us couldn't imagine. Enemies hounded him constantly. But Paul never was hopelessly cornered. He was never abandoned by God. The power of God shone through. Even to unbelievers. And it can happen with me and you too. God's power, regardless of what we're going through, God's power can shine through us and have an effect on unbelievers. When we constantly overcome what seemingly are impossible pressures, God's strength is exhibited. His power is obvious. We can prevail in spite of outward pressures, but we can also prevail against inward pressure. Paul said, uh, you know, I'm perplexed, but not in despair. We can be at our wits end, but not out of our wits. Just like you and me, Paul could not understand all that God permitted to happen in his life. But even in his mental agitation, in his times of confusion, God's power brought about a great victory in Paul's life. That's good news. See, this distracted man was able to write Romans and Ephesians in the midst of some of his greatest suffering. The person who's naturally calm, cool, and collected may, may appear to be strong. But perhaps that person doesn't really exhibit the power of God. Rather, God's power reveals itself when our minds are about to snap. But His presence sustains us. When we're at our weakest, God is made strong. He makes us strong. And these pressures do reach a climax. Paul says we're struck down but not destroyed. Like a warrior who's been thrown to the ground by his enemy, sometimes we may feel like it's all over. We've reached the end. But in the strength of God, we're able to get up again. We're able to get up and face the fight. This enduring grace comes only from God. It's not something we can conjure up ourselves. Can you think of any other way to find strength? The strength you need to go on in your weakest hour, but by the grace of God, I can't. See, the power of God does prevail in the midst of our greatest difficulties. Finally, this morning... The death to self releases the life of Christ. Death to self releases life of Christ. Behind the Christian's conquest, in spite of our weakness, rests one great principle. The conquering Christian actually reproduces the death of Christ. What are you talking about? Well, look at verses 10 and 11. The first part of each of these verses, Paul says, always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then down in verse 11, for we who, are, or for we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake. So like Daniel, who was thrown into the lion's den, Paul was constantly on the edge of death. For the sake of Christ. He was constantly. Just on the brink. Daily danger. And distress. These were. They had to be sapping away. At his very life. 
knowing that he could die at any moment for Christ. And do we face that kind of threat? No. Not daily. We may if we're on the mission field somewhere. There may come a day, and it wouldn't surprise me if it, here in America where we, where we would face that kind of persecution, but not like Paul knew daily. But we must face death daily in the sense of our own egos. Think about it. We must die to self. We must die to our wants and desires. Our own ego must die daily. Say, so I don't like the way people behave. I don't like the way these Christians behave. It's not my job to like or not like the way other Christians behave. My job is to behave the way Jesus wants me to behave. My job is to love other people, regardless of how I feel loved, or whether I feel loved or not. And so the only way I can do that is to allow my own ego to die daily. And so it's no longer about me. Because that's when we really seem to be most offended with other people, when it's all about us. Well, that offends me. Tough. <laughs> it's not all about me. We should be offended by what offends Jesus. We should be offended by what offends our God. We must face ego death daily. We have to reproduce in ourselves Christ's death to self. As he died physically and in and, 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 and all real ways imaginable, we must die to ourselves daily. And when this happens, we experience resurrection. We experience the resurrection life in Christ. You see verses uh, 10 and 11. We didn't read the whole verse. I want to go back and look at them again. Always caring about in the body, the dying of the Lord Jesus. But look at the next part. That the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. His life. And then in verse 11, For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake. Why? That the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. See, in Paul's frail, weary, and battered person, he bears the dying Jesus so that the life of the resurrection of Jesus may be exhibited to the rest of the world. So the question for you and I this morning, when people look at us, do they see the life of Christ being exhibited? Do they see Jesus in us? A song was written a number of years ago, sang uh, by, by the Imperials, and it's a song I, I've, I've never forgotten. And it says, The only Jesus some will ever see. That's who you and I are. The only Jesus some people will ever see. The only words of life that some will ever read. So let them see in you the one in who is all they'll ever need. Because you're the only Jesus some will ever see. Folks, there is a secret source for 
a successful Christian life. And it's a life energy that comes from the living and reigning Jesus. And what it requires is for us to become weak. For us to, to admit our weakness and allow Him to be strong. Does He live in you? Does He reign in your heart today? One final thought. In Mark chapter 8, verses 34 and 35, When he had called the people to himself, he, with his disciples also, he said to them, Jesus said to them, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. The world says be strong. The world says exert yourself. The world says, you know, be, be tough. Jesus says, deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. Every day, we need to be aware of our weaknesses. so that we can recognize his strength. With heads bowed and eyes closed, whatever your need may be this morning, if you're here today without Jesus, you've never experienced his strength, I want to invite you to come, to trust him today. Christian, have you been trying to do it all in your strength? Have you been trying to get by in your own power? Have you been mistakenly believing that it's all about you when truly it's all about Him? Heavenly Father, there's no doubt some here today who don't have a relationship with you through Jesus. And Father, we just pray that today would be the day of salvation. As your word says, that they would recognize that. They would just put aside all their pride, recognize their frailty, and step out. And trust you today through Jesus. Father, for those of us who are who are part of the family of faith, but sometimes depend on our own strength, try to do things on our own. Forget that it's, it's not all about us. Help us, Lord, to, to just surrender completely to the Lord Jesus. Admit our, our weaknesses and rest in His strength. Father, for those who, who maybe the, the Holy Spirit has led here to be a part of this family of faith, help them to recognize that you want them to serve you. You have a place for them to serve. Help us, Lord, to, to open our doors and make them welcome. Father, whatever need we may have this morning, help us to be obedient. Recognize that our only strength can come from you. And we'll make our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Whatever your need this morning. For